is Chester Ho. I'm、um, an associate professor at the University of Calgary and also head of the、uh, division of physical medicine rehab there as well. So、um, my career is really all about spinal cord injury, and、uh, my clinical practice as well as my research is all about spinal cord injury. So、um, this is my passion, and I'm really glad to be here to share this with you. And、um, thanks for staying behind. I see that I've cleared the room. But anyway,、um, now I'm just wondering、um, how many of you are really、uh, seeing patients with spinal cord injury on a regular basis? Got quite a few people here. So thank you. So、um, I have three objectives today. So the first one is just to go through the scope of the problem、uh, with pressure injuries in people with spinal cord injury. And secondly, I'd like to go through with you the specific risk factors in this population. Then thirdly,、um, I'd like to go through the、uh, prevention and management st、uh, strategies, which are very specific to this population. So how big is the problem? Well,、um, as you know, spinal cord injury really affects every single body organ system. And、uh, if I want to go through them, I'll just be very brief here. So the motor system, basically, as you know,、um, there may be paralysis, and so people are、um, not very mobile, and there may be muscle atrophy as well. And as a result, there could also be respiratory insufficiency from the、uh, weakness in the respiratory muscles. Then, in terms of the sensory system,、um, there's also impaired sensation below the level of the injury. The autonomic nervous system is also affected, so the blood pressure may be quite low in some people with spinal cord injury, and、um, also there may be loss of bowel and bladder control as well. Then, the immune system is also affected. This may not be.、Uh, Uh, Recognised by many people, but、uh, for those of you who treat people with spinal cord injury, you know you've seen peop、uh, those people with some humongous pressure ulcers, right? Pressure injuries, and yet they don't seem to have any inflammatory reaction, right? No fever, nothing, and so、um, they do have quite a different immune response. And、um, then also psychosocially, I think that's a, another big one that we should not forget. That、um, it's really affected. So you can see that I'm trying to build up a picture here that all of these organ systems are affected, and all of them actually increase the risk of pressure injury development, right? And so now you can see the full picture. In terms of the incidence, it really depends on what report you read. So、um, it's been reported to be anywhere between 23 to 37 percent. But no matter what report you read, that, that means that it's just a very high number, isn't it? And then some report actually even said that 95 percent of people with spinal cord injury will experience a pressure injury sometime throughout their lifetime. So it's if, it, essentially everybody's problem. And then、um, another report said that 17% had at least one new pressure injury every two years, and、um, it also then went on to say that 4% will have a continuous pressure injury, and so I think that's really quite staggering. So we talked about the、uh, incidence, but how about the costs? The costs are really high as well as you can imagine, and、um, so it's not just for. The healthcare system, but more importantly, it's actually very expensive for the individual themselves, right? For their cost in terms of their quality of life, their loss of、uh, you know work days, etc. And in fact, it's been known to be the main reason for their rehospitalization. As you know,、uh, you know, care in the hospital is actually the most、uh, most expensive kind of care, right? So.、Um, You can imagine that、um, uh, this being the main reason for rehospitalization means that it is very costly. There are some Canadian data about this. So, on average, the healthcare cost of、um, hospital-acquired pressure injury in the、uh, um, SCI population is about twenty thousand dollars, and the average cost for a community-acquired pressure injury is about five thousand dollars. Now, these numbers are much lower than that. Reported by、uh, other countries in the U.S., etc. Right, but I think there are different、uh, ways of、uh, calculating it. But、uh, the bottom line is that it is quite expensive. And、um, I think that one thing that I also want to mention is that um, in the um, um,、uh, SCI pressure injury uh, uh, guidelines that we have、um, in Canada. 
uh, by Dr. Halton and the team, it did mention that uh, people with spinal cord injury really ought to have access to uh, specialty care. And uh, but we also realize that that's not always the case. People in uh, the community with spinal cord injury and pressure injuries always do not really have that access. So I think that I, I put that down as part of the problem because we really want to make sure that as care providers, we connect with people with um, the expertise um, in the rehab centers or wherever uh, that may be so that um, you have really that good connection. Now, so that now I've gone through the scope of the problem, let me go through the risk factors with you. As I mentioned, the risk factors are quite different, right? And um, also, I think that at different phases after the injury, they may change as well. So we really have to be careful there. Unless we really identify the risk factors, we're not going to be um, very um, uh, effective in how we manage the risks. And we also want to make sure that uh, we always put prevention as the uh, emphasis as well. So what are the risk factors? I have listed here a number of risk factors from a number of studies. So male gender and also motor impairment, muscle atrophy contractures, not surprising, right? And sensory impairment, urinary incontinence, uh, lower blood pressure, hence uh, compromised tissue perfusion. As I had mentioned, right, people with spinal cord injury may have lower blood pressure, so you know that their tissue perfusion may be affected. Nutritional compromise and also diabetes. Don't forget that this population has also a higher incidence of diabetes as well, so that may really compound the problem. And one thing that we must always remember is that people with previous history of pressure injuries are always at a much higher risk of having another pressure injury. So I think that's really something to keep in mind. And also the longer duration since the injury seems to carry a high risk as well. And um, one thing that I also want to emphasize also is that there is an, uh, an association between our pressure injuries and DVT and also autonomic dysreflexia as well. So sometimes you may uh, see DVT and autonomic dysreflexia uh, together with pressure injury. So, so you may want to think about these things together. Now for those of you who may not be familiar with autonomic dysreflexia, basically it's the loss of autonomic nervous system control um, after a spinal cord injury, especially above the level of T6. And uh, so that's something that uh, we always have to deal with. So how about our risk assessment tools? Well, the Braden has been used quite a lot as well, and uh, Waterloo. But then um, over the years, people have also recognized that there are uh, specific um, or tools that uh, may be better for spinal cord injury, such as the uh, SkyPress or SCIPUS, uh, SCI Pressure Ulcer Scale. That's, been, uh, that's being used right now. And uh, it's been found to be uh, pretty uh, good. But at the same time, um, I think that it's still not widely used because one has to take into um, the, the whole context, right? If, uh, if people um, in the rehab center is using the uh, Skypers, but then um, their uh, associate facilities are not using it, so that can be a problem. So when we implement something, we have to think about the bigger context. But anyway, um, just so that you are aware, this uh, Skypers has uh, seven domains. So the level of activity, the levels of mobility, severity of spinal cord injury, uh, urinary incontinence, and also uh, pre-existing conditions, which are listed here, as well as um, their residency status and nutrition. So these are not surprising to you, but uh, at the same time, um, um, you know, they are all included in this uh, uh, tool here. So it's just something for you to be aware of. Now, let's talk about the prevention and management strategies, because I think this is actually uh, probably the most important part. So 
I had gone through with you multiple risk factors associated with spinal cord injury, right? So, of course, that means that we have to have a good and solid interdisciplinary approach because not one discipline is going to be able to address all of these issues. So we have to have a very strong and robust team to address all of those multiple risk factors. So. Um, of course, we also want to emphasize that the individual, the patient, the client is the center of the team because without that person's participation, um, it's not going to be successful. And once again, I want to say that um, we have to make sure that um, if you are not connected to a spinal cord injury specialty team, um, that would be important as well because they are your, your resource uh, for a lot of the issues. So I'm going to talk about some specific uh, strategies here. So this is by no means the overall comprehensive strategy because, again, if you go back to the Canadian guidelines, it's this thick. And so we're just going to summarize this within the next 10 minutes. Okay, so first of all, um, pressure injury. So how about the pressure redistribution, right? So we have to think about this um, for all of the surfaces, not just the sleep surface, but also the seating surface and uh, positioning. So all of those things you're really familiar with. But one thing that I do want to say is that, um, especially for seating, I'm a strong advocate that people need to be able to control their uh, repositioning. So um, many, many of us, sometimes have to fight with the system, right? To make sure that uh, people with, in the, uh, with spinal cord injuries will get a power chair, will get a tilt chair. So I strongly continue to advocate for that because if we do not have that for our clients, we are doing them a disservice. And um, I also want to emphasize on the importance of bowel and bladder management because we all know that incontinence and uh, moisture, etc., is a risk factor for pressure injury formation. And in this population, the bowel and bladder is always or oftentimes affected. So if we don't have a good bowel and bladder program, then it's going to increase the risk again, right? And don't forget that uh, in this population, there are different ways to manage the bowel because they can have an upper motor neuron bowel versus a lower motor neuron bowel. I can talk about it for another lecture, so I'm not going to go into the details, but if you have questions about that, we can talk about that later on. And there are guidelines on how to manage the upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron bowel here. So uh, just keep that in mind. And again, consult with your uh, friendly local uh, SEI team if you have questions about that. Now, the next one is interesting, and uh, Dee will talk about this more later on. It's on spasticity, contractures, and heterotopic ossification. So, um, this is the, uh, these are all of the, uh, not all of the, many of the um, MSK kind of complications, right, after a spinal cord injury. And um, so I, I wonder if you are familiar with heterotopic ossification? Yeah, so many of you are, but for those of you who are not familiar with it, basically um, heterotopic ossification um, means that um, there is extra bone growth in particular areas in the, uh, in the soft tissues after a spinal cord injury, um, sometimes around the hips, sometimes around the knees, and you may see that as bony swelling. And so that can really increase the pressure, right, if, as you can imagine. And together with spasticity and auto contractures, that can put the individual in a very unfavorable position for uh, pressure redistribution. So we really have to um, keep that in mind and also, if possible, prevent that from happening. And uh, pain. Now, this is an interesting one. People may think that, well, after a spinal cord injury, they don't feel pain, right? So what are you talking about? Actually, some do feel pain because it depends on your severity of the injury. And also, sometimes they may not feel pain, but then they actually may have other body reactions towards a noxious stimulus. They may sweat a lot. They may have autonomic dysreflexia. They may have spasticity as a response to noxious stimulus. And so all of these actually, again, you can imagine, can put uh, that individual at a high risk for pressure injury development. So keep that in mind. 
The next one is uh, infection and osteomyelitis. This is also very interesting because sometimes you look at that individual, as I had mentioned before, they look so well. They may have a big whopping stage four pressure injury. You know, that, that's the size of a grapefruit in their buttocks, but they look like they're just fine. They have no, you know, immune response. They have no kind of systematic response to that. And yet, could they have an infection? Yes. Could they have underlying osteomyelitis? Yes, absolutely. So you have to be mindful of that. And do not just look at that individual and, and think that, well, they're a fair brow, they look just fine. No, do some more investigations. Check your C-reactive protein, check your you know, white cell count, check other parameters. Do radiographic studies to see if they have underlying infection or osteomyelitis. Because if we, again, don't recognize it, then um, the uh, problem will be uh, much larger and difficult to manage. And then um, I also want to talk briefly about uh, adjunctive treatments or biophysical agents, because um, there's actually quite strong evidence for uh, things such as electrical stimulation uh, on the treatment of pressure injuries in this population. And yet, we really grossly underuse it. And I think that is for a number of reasons, but um, I think that we really want to think about uh, using evidence-based practice to treat uh, these pressure injuries. And um, I know that um, also many of us, you know, think about the use of uh, negative pressure wound therapy as well uh, for, um, uh, for some of these chronic pressure injuries. But actually, the evidence in this population is lacking for the use of it um, uh, in uh, the chronic non-healing uh, pressure injuries. So again, we have to think about that a bit more carefully. Now, oftentimes it does come to surgery because um, surgery may be necessary in some non-healing uh, pressure injuries or when uh, the uh, situation is necessary. But I want to emphasize that um, surgery is not the only management uh, emphasis there. Because if we don't plan for this carefully, then it will be a disaster post-op. I'm sure that many of you who deal with this population and who actually handle them uh, post-operatively know that you really have to have a good plan, right? You really have to help the client understand that post-operatively, you have to have a very clear and good seating, progressive seating protocol to gradually get the person up. And you have to have a very good protocol for post-flap management, and you have to work collaboratively, collaboratively with your surgical colleagues, otherwise it will just break down. And also, don't forget that in the literature, there is a high um, incidence of recurrence of pressure injuries post-op. I think that there are multiple reasons for that, not necessarily because they're not, um, you know, uh, well done, the surgeries are not well done, if they could be very well done, it could be uh, many uh, risk factors, such as um, how about um, the individual's um, psychosocial status. And I think that we have to consider all of those things really carefully before, during, and after surgery. So just to summarize, uh, I think that, uh, well, I hope that I have painted a picture here that uh, people with spinal cord injury are at high risk of pressure injuries. And then we also need to recognize their unique risk factors with special attention to prevention and management. And also, uh, we need to uh, recognize the importance of the interdisciplinary team because of the diversity of the issues uh, that we encounter. Then lastly, uh, if you're not connected already, make sure that uh, you're connected to your local spinal cord injury uh, specialty team uh, resources. Thank you. We have some time for questions. Uh, I've run into this a couple of times. When you go to pack a wound, uh, they, they get a, a very acute uh, dysreflexia. And I'm just wondering if there's any, any resources as to, as to how to deal with that, because you can't really pack that wound because yeah. of the, the result of dysreflexia. Sure. So the question is, um, sometimes when one packs the wound, 
then um, the individual has severe autonomic dysreflexia. So what would one do about that? So um, again, just for those of you who may not be familiar with um, autonomic dysreflexia, it is an uncontrolled um, sympathetic output um, that is resulted of by um, noxious stimuli, especially for those with a level of injury above T6. So essentially, that individual may have a sudden surge in blood pressure and also may have bradycardia as a result as well. And if it's really serious, it can cause a stroke or uh, myocardial infarction, so it could be quite dangerous. So um, just to go back to that question, um, well, I think that I have encountered that uh, as well. I think that sometimes we have to think about several things. One is, um, I, I, I don't mean your situation, but in some cases, are we really packing the room too, too much? Are we doing that loosely? Or are we using too much packing? But sometimes, you know, it's just that when you irritate the wound, when you actually have the individual, you know, lay on the wound again later on, they get this reflexive. So what would you do? Now, I don't think there is a standard answer to this or there are standard guidelines, but I'll tell you what I do. Maybe I can also open this up to um, the rest of you, because um, it seems like many of you have had experience with this population too. Sometimes I actually even use some, something like lidocaine jelly, just to numb up that area. Because don't forget that even though this population does not feel pain sometimes, uh, but their body actually can perceive that pain. Um, but um, so the uh, local nerve endings are not really um, affected, right? They can still, um, the body can still perceive the pain, though they may not perceive, perceive it themselves. So that's sometimes what I do uh, when they really get into trouble, and it does seem to work. And um, anyone else with other tips or any similar situation that you want to share with uh, dysreflexia during uh, dressing change or with packing? I got up to um, to thank you because you're my spinal cord injury um, go-to team in Calgary. I work in home care in Calgary, and it's fantastic that you're you and your team uh, at the foothills. It's so approachable, and we can just call you and bounce ideas off of you or Raj. And uh, I just wanted to thank you for that. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Well, that was not planted. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, this reflexia is uh, something that we struggle with with some clients more than others. And um, sometimes that's a big factor in, uh, I'm an occupational therapist, so I tend to do offloading um, in choosing the cushion or mattress that the client ends up using on the long term. That can be a huge factor, along with the you know, pressure mapping and all the other things. Sometimes it maps well, but the client just can't tolerate it, and it mm -hmm. seems to be because it's just reflexia. So I, I don't know. Yeah, um, thank you. And um, actually, recently I had a big discussion with um, Dr. Andre Krasikov. Um, I'm sure many of you know him. Uh, he is a world expert in autonomic dysfunction after spinal cord injury uh, at UBC. And I asked him, so I said, Andre, what do I do with uh, my, my, my patients who have such, you know, difficult to treat uh, blood pressure and um, autonomic dysreflexia? Their blood pressure go, goes up and down like a yo-yo all day long, and so what do we do? And so, um, actually, we had a very good discussion about that. And uh, it turns out that um, in his research and in my observation with um, uh, one patient that we recently did a 24-hour blood pressure monitoring, it turns out that their blood pressure actually really does go up and down like a yo-yo all day long. Sometimes you don't even know that they are in dysreflexia when their blood pressure is very high already. And so what do we do with it? Well, I think that um, they had um, uh, some suggestions. Uh, one is that um, you actually um, can uh, try to use um, a nitro patch. 
And uh, so some of us use nitro paste, and so we can wipe it off, or the client and the families know that well, and they can wipe it off themselves. But sometimes I was told that uh, in some settings that could be difficult with uh, healthcare workers, because if, if they get that on their fingers or skin, they can go hypotensive themselves. And uh, so some settings don't like to use nitro paste, but then um, um, uh, it is less expensive than nitro patch, but uh, with nitro patches, um, that can be quite effective. You can also remove the patch um, as you need it. And so maybe, you know, another thought is when, you're, when you know that your client's going to be dysreflexic, you could also put on a patch at the same time, and then you monitor their, um, your, their vital signs and blood pressure, and when it's fine, you can take it off. So that's another thing to think about. And I do want to go back to the point of, again about uh, connection to your local uh, spinal cord injury team because that's in the best practice guidelines for um, the for uh, spinal cord injury uh, pressure injuries. And so um, I strongly recommend that um, if you don't have the connection, make the connection. And if you are from an SEI center, make sure that you make yourself available to the community as well because uh, that's important and it's in the best practice guidelines. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you.